All right, welcome everybody. What is it? Day six, uh, week three. Uh, everything is fine. Now, <clears throat> the last time was pretty inglorious. Uh, we got an HID crash. Luckily, it was at the one hour mark, so it still it still was half decent stream. Uh, vector store. I mean, that makes it a a prerequisite sort of starting point for a lot of stuff. So I hope people caught up with that one. Uh, it's pretty dear to me. Now, I wanted to actually do half an hour of applied stuff uh, uh, during the last stream. Uh, but, uh, well, basically the HID crash prevented us from doing it. So we're gonna start with that. Uh, now, some people in chat are saying, uh, I have to catch up with the past sessions. Uh, the only prerequisite is knowing a little bit about vectors because that's what we're gonna apply today but you can probably decouple the two and catch up to that later. So let's get to it. Now, as far as for what we want to achieve uh, this time around, uh, we have the rig in an okay state for the rotation of the pedals. And we were saying that we want this, so we have the counter rotation and we said that we wanted to add a IK and some switching to it uh, off stream. The only thing I've actually done is uh, get myself a curve that we'll use for the IK and that's it because you don't want to know, see me noodling curves, curves together on stream, I imagine. Now, uh, as far as something that like probably the most comments I got on anything privately and on YouTube is the unique conversion nodes, uh, suggestions for removing them and all of that. I mean, I'm somewhat maybe a little bothered by it, but not so much really uh, that I'm going to jump through hoops to replace them. But a trick that was pointed out, if you want, is negate something so it doesn't work for the add, but it does work for uh, the multiply. If you have one is you can use uh, blend nodes. So you have several blends that were added when they added anim layers, I believe, and they often go under the radar, but they're actually pretty good nodes uh, because they're the only nodes in Maya that I know of, at least, uh, actually there is, yeah, uh, that have proper typing. So you have anim blend node additive rotation, and this will allow you to blend between two inputs. Uh, and well, in this case, it's a triplet of angles, so you can blend between Eulers uh, as a set, which is convenient at times. But the main thing is they also have weight. So if all you want to do is negating an angle, which I think we're doing somewhere, uh, then a little bit of a, you know, the granny found out this weird trick. Uh, you can just connect the angles, like one angle into one of the inputs, set one of the weights to minus one, and that will basically, all it will be doing uh, will be negating that one angle. Now, they're relatively fat nodes, but they're also relatively fast for what we're, for what we're doing, probably faster than having to punch in three or four add the unit conversions. So yeah, there you go. You might use that if you want. Uh, so as far as vectors go uh, and first application, what we established the last time, so let me see, okay. What we established the last time is uh, dot products and cross products. Dot products and length is mostly what we wanted. So if, super quick recap, if we have a vector 2D or 3D, same thing really, it's just one added dimension. Uh, the length of that vector we've established is Pythagoras theorem. So if you have the X coordinate and the Y coordinate for the two, so Y and X, uh, the square of one side plus the square of the other gets you these, uh, this actual square. Uh, which is the one built on the hypotenuse. So if you square root that one, you actually get the length of the vector, which is the magnitude, and it's always gonna be positive uh, from, the, um, from the two coordinates. Uh, it's the same thing in, uh, it's the same thing in 3D. It's just the addition of uh, one more coordinate. So it becomes, and again, I was saying that is uh, pretty, if this is a 3D system, uh, it's still pretty obvious in a way that you're applying Pythagorean in that case because you could imagine this. If you take the uh, the y and the and x components of this, what you will basically be doing if this is that vector projected, so reduce without having this component, let's say it's the z, uh, 
uh, if you take its x and y and you build these uh, then what you have is that this is basically the side that is missing from this uh, rectangle triangle so you will be doing the square of these plus the square of these which gets you that plus the square of that will get you the hypotenuse in a further dimension and this scales up pretty well so moving on uh, couple things notation wise uh, and last time I was saying, I don't remember what the actual uh, scalar to vector, not the scalar product, which is the dot product, but the scalar to vector, often called the scale up, uh, is called. And apparently it's not called anything. Uh, people call it the scalar product and put an alt saying, you know, don't confuse it with the other scalar product, which is utterly confusing. But the thing that we're interested in in this, and uh, now normally I will write a bunch of nodes that would take maybe 20 minutes each or something like that to get more vector maths into my and eventually in season one I think we'll do that pretty early on uh, but in this case I want to start from the mini lamai everything and this gives us a chance to actually show how some operations relate to each other so it's pretty convenient to be able to get the length of a vector uh, because if you can get the length of a vector you can actually well, do things with it obviously but you can also uh, you can also scale it down which is uh, often done to normalize something and the other thing we're saying is if you have a vector that is of uh, any length so this is my vector v and the length of a vector by the way you will find it sometimes in pure vector maths uh, indicated with two lines in maths um, and that's normally an absolute and the magnitude of a vector is also uh, it's only absolute, uh, but you will sometimes find it in more mathematical language uh, with the uh, double pipes on the sides. So just know that if you ever see any vector math, if you if any vector math, if you decide to read about it, uh, these are pretty much equivalent and it means the length of a vector. Now, the other thing we're interested in is the norm or the unit, which is the same thing. So if you have a vector, um, if you have a vector v, and this will be a lowercase v, and well, sure, let's add a serif, uh, then the unit vector of it will be, uh, and you could, you could say it's a v prime, but the unit vector of v will be the, uh, will be this vector scaled down to what your norm is, and most of the time you will find that the norm is one, so let's say that this was 2.1, you want something that has the same direction but you want it with the length of one and that's pretty important and we'll see super soon that's called the normalization it's a reduction to unit whatever you want to call it and that is where this stuff comes uh, comes in handy because uh, what you do to find the normal of a vector is uh, you take the full vector you get its length uh, which is whatever letter you want to use l let's say now if you want to scale something down to a norm, what you do is you divide that something, whatever it is, by its norm factor. So in this case, if you take a vector that is of length 2.1 and it has x, y, and z, and you divide each of them by whatever the norm factor is. So uh, in this case, the length of our vector, there's no need for that actually then what you get is the same direction, but it's normalized by one. Uh, sorry, it's normalized to a length of one. And uh, the um, obvious, I guess, if you remember like very, very basic uh, algebra is that if this is our row vector, that basically means that we can do a scalar operation. This is not a dot product, but if you see a scalar by it, uh, which on websites is easy because they often, when they're mixing scalars and vectors, uh, they often use bold for vectors and uh, normal, like non bold and characters for scalars. Then what you would have is that you multiply by uh, one divided by L. So, and that will get you uh, the unit vector. So the convenient thing about it is that if you want this vector to have a fixed length, so let's say you want whatever length of that vector, which we say, you know, in this case might be 2.1, you want this vector, but you want it to be the same vector three units long, you normalize it first, uh, that gets it to one, and then you can normalize it to your, uh, to your new length, whatever it is. Oh, come on, I can do this. And that will get you your rescale vector. 
So, to do that, uh, in an ideal world, you would spend, uh, well, in an ideal world, you wouldn't have to spend any time at all and there will be a vector length node. There might be one, I don't know of one, if there is one, you could use male expressions to simplify things, but we want to do everything with nodes for as long as possible. So now I need to switch mentally what, um, uh, what shortcuts I'm using. So let's uh, take them off here, get ourselves a new tab. Now, what we want to show is that the dot product, which we mentioned before, can actually be used to hack the system. So uh, let's hide this stuff, uh, get ourselves any object will do really. So what we want, let's say, is to get this cone to some, never noticed the node editor having tabs. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're actually like browser tabs, I think I mentioned before. So if you middle click on one, it will actually close it. Uh, they will also sometimes absolutely brutalize uh, your uh, your actual graphs and node editor bookmarks and stuff like that, they can be finicky. But in general, like if you're doing multiple components at once, uh, keep track of your tabs, save often. Now, uh, and I say that in the last stream, I think I didn't save for like 50 minutes, right? So what we want to do in the simplest case for something like an IK is, uh, let's say get this thing to uh, follow this one with the limit. So if I just wanted the two objects, and I'm working in word space here, we'll look at word to local space conversions in a bit, but in a very, very uh, shallow manner. This is what we've been doing in so far for a lot of stuff, and this just gets one object to follow the other. Now, if we actually wanted some limited version of these, uh, we could actually, there is a vector product. Yep. We could take this vector, Let's actually show the ports. Uh, take this vector, normalize output, choose to have no operation. And if you choose to have no operation, all that's going to happen is the normalization. And now what is going to happen is that, let me zoom in a little bit closer. What is going to happen with this is that basically this object is now taking this position, which is literally the arrow pointing there. And going like that, it's getting normalized, so the length is scaled down to uh, is scaled down to one in this case, and it's following. So let's say that you want the spherical constraints, and a spherical constraints. We're going to illustrate things in two D because you know we're not in VR where I can sketch in three D, but the notion is pretty simple. You have a point in space, you have another point in space, which is your target. So this will be, this will probably be a centroid, but you don't really need to look it up. It doesn't really matter. And you want some object to be at a fixed distance from the centroid to uh, P or probably just the center. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So if you take the vector of P, which is just the position of what you want to modify and wherever this P is going to be in time, which doesn't mean, doesn't need to be necessarily around C in a nice circle. You just want something to circle around it. Uh, and if you're in 3D, so if you're using a 3D vector that is actually going to be uh, in a spherical space, all you need to do is what we just did. If you want the length to it, then all you need to do is multiply by something. So multiply divide should do it in this case. So if you want to multiply a vector by a scalar, uh, which is the rescale, which is a scalar product that is not the scalar product. Uh, all you have to do is take the three terms of the vectors uh, of the vector and multiply them by your factor, each of them. Normally, as we did here, you would have only the one factor, uh, but what you do is you multiply for each of these. So if you use the same factor, whatever that length is, it might be a single parameter that you have somewhere and you pipe it into all the inputs here. It's the same as multiplying them all by the same number. I hope that's uh, clear enough. So if that factor is uh, at one right now, that's not going to make a difference, but uh, put something else in. And what you have now is basically that circular constraint I was talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, there is now. The more interesting part, I guess, in the case of the pedals is that if we wanted that thing to be on a plane, so wherever I move these, 
on the plane of my choosing, which in this case is going to be of the word x-axis, um, well, this object sticks to a plane of my choosing, I can actually uh, take whatever I have and remove the term for that offset. Now, this is still not going to be exactly what we want, uh, but it's going to get pretty close. So now you basically have what a lot of people do with like multiple constraints, like aim constraints and then a point constraint or stuff like that to reduce things, which is a bit crazy to me. Uh, you can do it pretty much straight away with very simple vector ops. So that is, you know, a very, very, very simple implementation of an IK like behavior with a constraint length. And for the pedals, these will be enough. Uh, because we want the pedals to be at a constrained distance, which is the radius of whatever our staff is. Sorry, I need coffee. Uh, if this was some sort of IK where you want the reach behavior, as in that object should be reaching for the other. Am I suppressing right? Yeah. So uh, that, that can get a little bit trickier, I guess. Um, so yeah, in this case, you might see the, uh, no, in this case, you actually get the behavior um, semi-decently because this reduces itself enough. Uh, anyway, but yeah, you'll see that kind of behavior as you go through the center, obviously, because at, at zero, there's a switch to the other direction, which is also not uh, unlike you're used to in IK. So, uh, this should actually, if everything is being done right, this should be constraining our length. So let's go in uh, side view sorts and ensure that it's doing what I'm telling it to do. So take away the X term from this one. This should never have any X term. So what you actually want some other times is uh, a reaching behavior where this object will reach for that uh, and if you can reach it at a certain distance, uh, then it will just stop there. But if you can reach it, like in this case, this object is close enough to the center for my object to want to be here, which is the classic IK behavior. Like if you have multiple, uh, if you have multiple bones, then, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because it's not relevant to the pedals. But then what you need to do is basically you have a, you're normalizing here and you want to see if the length of this vector, after you've multiplied it, which is the one that's pointing to that object, uh, is greater or equal than the radius that you want to be limited by. So and let's go here. So if this vector, after the normalization and the multiplication, is exceeding this distance limit, then you're okay. You just want to keep that normalized vector and you use that. But if this point was inside that radius, say here, then you don't want to resize your actual um, your actual effector to be going here. You actually want it to stop there. So what you need to do in that case, which we haven't done in so far, is know the length of uh, know the length of this vector. Now. The length of that vector will be pretty trivial to find if you had something as simple as a vector length node or something as simple as a square root node. Uh, I don't know of either being available. You could use a mal expression, but I don't want to. So there's a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, I guess it's the node editor equivalent of a life hack in this case. Uh, switching gears, okay. So we've talked about the dot product and Okay, I can do this. We've talked about the dot product, which is if you have any two vectors uh, is going to give you something and I've talked about it in terms of projection. Uh, it's going to give you something angle relative that you could extract the projection of one vector on the other from uh, that projection is going to be skewed uh, unless this is a uh, this is an actual uni vector. Uh, but if this is a uni vector, you basically will get this length here, the length of the projection now. To look at that, which is pretty useful in this case, um, what you want to look at is what happens when you actually do a dot product. So uh, the dot product we say if you have a vector XYZ and you dot it for another vector XYZ, um, 
and this might be your point and this might be our uh, uh, whatever normalize something now the dot product between these two is gonna be uh, it's a scalar so it reduces to a single number and it's gonna be uh, well should do something like this um, px by what did I say this was n sure let's go for n uh, pm by nx plus and you go on for however many items you have here uh, this holds true for, um, for pretty much any vector uh, sorry for any vector dimensionality until you get to uh, pn in this case it will be p okay let's do it properly this will be p1 by n p0 by n0 so the first item in here all the way until you have uh, pn by n n which will be the last item you have so uh, chat if any of these doesn't make sense if i'm going too fast if i'm missing something uh let me know and i'll uh, i'll jump on questions uh, otherwise i'm gonna be rambling on for another couple minutes so uh here's the interesting property i was talking about uh the dot product of these two if you look at something like this it it already looks pretty close uh, to um, to the Pythagore uh, to the Pythagorean theorem that we talked about. So what the dot product basically gets you between these two vectors is actually what am I doing here? Okay, no color. So what it's actually doing for two vectors, let's say we have a and b because it's easy to write, is the length of a uh, by the length of b uh, by the cosine of uh, usually uh, you'll find it expresses theta it depends on what country you're in like in uh, southern europe it's often common to express the first trigonometric angle between things with alpha uh, in american literature you find it expressed a lot more with theta in some cases for calculus it starts with phi uh, don't ask me why greek letters uh, doesn't really matter all that much so and this is this is the interesting property i was talking about now uh, what that gives you, as I was saying, is a skewed projection. Why does it keep? Okay. Uh, is a skewed projection between these unless one of the two vectors is normalized. So if one of the two vectors is normalized, let's say that in this case we have A and B, and A was uh, a normal vector, this becomes 1. All right? So if this is one and it's part of just the multiplication, you can take away that term. So what is actually happening here is that for one of the vectors being one, being normalized, you get um, the result of the dot product being the uh, magnitude of a vector by the cosine of the angle between them. So two interesting things to that. So if both vectors were actually normalized, uh, and this is a super common operation, this term will go away as well, if it was one. Which means if you take two vectors and you normalize, um, normalize both vectors, and then you do the dot product, what you actually get is the angle between those two vectors, the trigonometric angle, uh, the angular momentum necessary to shift one vector to the other. Uh, uh, in yeah as a single scalar now we're not after that we're more interested in what happens if those two vectors one is normal and the other one isn't we're actually aligned now the um, if you're not familiar with trigonometry we'll go over this kind of stuff at some point but not right now so the cosine of uh, of angles uh, is a function that sort of goes like that and this is going to be terrible but and uh, and then it loops it cyclic so at zero your cosine is one which means that if your two vectors have a zero angle so and that is always the case obviously if you take the same vector if your uh, angle between is zero then the cosine of that angle is going to be one which means that if you take a vector and you dot product it by itself normalize, what you actually get is the magnitude of that vector. 
Uh, so chat, does that make sense? Uh, I hope so. But this is, you know, this is not ideal. Normally, like it'd be cheaper and better if you actually just did the length operation. But uh, if later on you look into optimization and you want to look at row maths or something and you want to reduce it, it's important to intuitively know these relationships and the fact that some things might reduce. Because if you know ahead of time, like so these formulas are super basic and you'll find them all over the place as you start actually looking into the maths behind 3D. So what is happening is I don't have a length node in here, but I do have uh, from this node the normalized vector and I do obviously have the vector itself. So what I can do is actually take one and dot product it by the other. Uh, now the dot product is commutative, so the because it's always positive, uh, an angle is always positive. Uh, it's it's always the angular momentum between two items. There's no direction to it that will make it a, a rotation slightly different term. Anyway, so what happens here is that by doing take the vector, normalize it, take the vector again, dot product it by itself, take away the normalization because you don't want to normalize again. Now what is going to happen? is that this is going to give, because Maya is trying to use a somewhat generic interface to allow you to do multiple things, it's going to pump the same number in X, Y, and Z. So I only need one of these. Now, if I take just the X for the sake of example, if I take just the X of these and pump it here, what you will see is that absolutely nothing happens because I'm probably forgetting to do something. Zero, zero, one. What am I doing here? Am I receiving nothing interesting? So input one, input two. Hmm. Found zero length output vector result is unpredictable. All right, only live on stream. So input one, normal, oh, what? Oh, okay, I've wired them up wrong, sorry. So, no, I haven't. Anyway, this is supposed to be the no op because I just wanted to normalize and this is supposed to be the dot product, my bad. So, let's reset these. Hopefully that didn't confuse anybody. But what I've done here basically is now whatever the length in 3D space, um, and it's tough to work with a sub subset of just one monitor. Whatever the length of this vector is, is now gonna be affecting the X of this object. Uh, does it make sense? The length of the displacement from where to here. Uh, let me know chat, otherwise I'm gonna keep soldiering on. So now that we have the length um, and we have a base radius, let's say of uh, three, like we were using, yeah, we're using uh, three here and we were actually uh, reducing one of the axes, which we don't want to do anymore in this case. Uh, bear in mind, I was reducing after the normalization, which might be off axis, so that would, uh, uh, that would have been not ideal. I don't want to go into that. We'll go into the axis reduction later on because we need it for the pedals. So this is, you know, this is convoluted in a way, and it's due to a limitation. We don't have the nodes we need, but uh, knowledge being power and all of that, if you know what the fundamental operations do, uh, you can take more complex nodes and basically uh, force them into reducing things to, forcing to reduce more complex terms to the actual simple operations you want. It's a bit ass backwards, but it works. Um, so, next thing, uh, we want to take an if condition. Uh, what is it, condition nodes? Yep. Oh, there's a float condition. I didn't remember that one. Uh, so that's pretty good. Uh, I didn't remember it having a condition for it just floats. Uh, I like it. So what we want is condition. Hmm. So it wants a bullet throw. Okay. 
So it wants a separate operation. So all right, bugger it for now. We're gonna use the old condition node, which shortens things a little bit. Now, what we want to do is, um, this is, it's a bit wasteful again, because we only really care about, um, but we have to use, uh, we have to use multiple. So we want to say, come on, if this second vector, which is our length, and a lot of people seem not to know this, but you can actually use my nodes as pass through. So if, come on, okay. So if my first vector here, uh, sorry, if the length of my first vector here, the dot I've done, uh, and this is gonna have the same, should have the same number on all three. So what was I doing now? Yep. Sorry, yeah, I'm making you reduce to x because that's a dot, that's correct. And, and this was, I'm forgetting what I'm doing now. So this was a no op, and this was the length. And the second one here, my input two was the length. Okay, I'm, I now have it. So only one term, the x, is all we care about, and the x for this, and I'm saying, want to do it the other way for sake yeah so I'm saying if the length that I will take here which is the actual length of my vector is uh, let's say greater than 3.0 which is the term I'm extracting here so let's say greater than then there's a color of true, color is false. What am I doing? First term, second term, I'm doing just this plain wrong. So there is actually singles for what I wanted. Sorry for that. Uh, logic nodes are new. Uh, yeah, some, some, of the, some of the logic nodes are. The condition, this one has been around for years. I remember using it at least as far back as 2015. Sorry, I've been, I've been making a bit of a confusion here. Um, so first term, I'm going to be taking from this vector product that I'm running. Uh, this is the dot product, which is the one, it's the trick I'm using, dot producting something by, um, by the normalized self to get the length. I'm only outputting one term, which is the length of the vector. I have a second one, which is I'm rescaling this vector, but because I'm rescaling it by a certain length, uh, that also contains my desire length, which is free. So I'm saying if um, if the length of this vector is greater, so if the, yeah, if the length of this vector is greater than three, then what I actually want is the vector that I have scaled to three. So color and I've used greater than, greater than. So if the length, if the length is greater, I'm going to use what is basically the clamp vector. Now, if that is not true, so if the length is less than, then I want to use the original vector, which is going to be my translation. It's actually pretty hard to do this stuff while talking about it. It's, it takes five minutes to do uh, if you just know what you're doing, more or less. So that is what I was talking about when I was talking about a more IK-like behavior. So what we have done here, and this wouldn't be the case for the pedals, uh, but uh, but I think it's pretty applicable. It's pretty important. I wanted to show what happens with the uh, with the operations on the uh, on the dot product to normalize self. So this is basically what you want for an IK-like behavior, where you go, okay, I've established the limit uh, by normalizing the displacement and scaling it to where I want it. And if I'm exceeding that limit, then just stop there. Just reduce this vector to the scale part. But if I'm within that limit for which I need the length, and that's why we did the life hackery with the dot product by normalized self, uh, then just reach that far. You don't need to pick something else that's been scaled down. So if you're referring to the condition node, it's been there for as long as I've been using mine, probably much before then. Um, yeah, chat, chat is going on about the nodes. Anyway, 
Uh, there's there's a couple f for those that are catching up now in chat. If you're watching these on YouTube, this is just repetition. Uh, there's a few condition nodes that seem to be fairly new, but they are they're actually good condition nodes. They are they are literally down to bool and the terms. Uh, but you also still have the old condition node, which is what I'm using here, that has a switch so that you can choose what kind of operation it is and so on. So I'm using that for now. Uh, hopefully it all makes sense up to here because uh, I'd like to move on. So chat, let me know. If it does all make sense, we move on. Now, we have the pedal IK. All this noddling here was just for the sake of example, so we don't really care about it. Uh, but we do, we could probably recycle the normalize and the scale. Uh, you know, waste not, one not. But this stuff we don't need. So here I have, and we might want to start naming things at some point for these nodes. Here I have, I had isolated some stuff and hidden some stuff. Okay, the isolate. Now, I don't really care much for the geometry just yet. What I want to get is uh, start embedding my graph into what I have. So we have the pedals component that's in decent enough shape. It has a local word that should move and uh, follow. I think it will even follow the rotation properly. Yeah, we will move with the uh, with the input that we receive from the God node. It's what we want. It's great. Now, what we want to do is start adding this one. So in the controls, we have this stuff here, which uh, we have now established to be FK and we want the IK to be separate. Now that means that you might want to rename these things or you could assume, like speaking of naming conventions, you could assume defaults. If you know that you always have FK, then don't add FK to everything and just add IK to the things that are IK. Personally, I prefer to always have the variation in there because I find that most rigs will have some components that have both FK, IK, some that have only FK, pretty common, rarely, but not impossible, some that have IK only. So I always specify. In this case, I'm gonna take the lazy route because I don't want to rename eight items. And I finished my coffee. I wish I had more. So, uh, naming convention we can take from here and uh, paste it in here. So this will be something like pedal IK like will do. Now, here's something when I was talking about letters, see how in sans serif, uh, there is never something like this, there's this confusion between lowercase L and uppercase I. And this might be breaking convention. Going back to the naming convention stuff, this is part of the war, but we don't care. If we walk from the two ends, we don't care about whatever is in here. You can break convention, reestablish convention, local to that warble and you're gonna be fine. So this should be in center word before we start doing silly things with it. The other thing we want to do is most likely buffer it because uh, it's probably gonna be somewhere in the word by default. Um, usually you should start with the IK matching the FK. Uh, actually without, usually you normally want to match them all the time. This, very, 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 very few circumstances where you want FK and IK to start from different defaults or generating different transforms. Now, other thing to do is name that as an SRT buffer. So we're good with that. Now, I wish that when you add the nodes and you add them somewhere active in another view, it would actually paste the layout into the window you're bringing them in, but no. Does not work like that. Nah, this is not too bad of a layout anyway. So next thing we want to do is drive stuff with those. Uh, chat is eerily quiet, which means this is blindingly clear and amazing, or people are completely lost. I can only hope that it's actually the former. Peep up guys, um, even just to let me know that this is still making sense. Um, and I usually work with grid snapping on. I don't know why I've been turning it off before. So 
All right. Uh, next thing we want to do is uh, be able to take this buffer, which we have been in so far controlling with the offsets of sort. What is it? So that's the pedals buffer. Uh, this is this should be the item that drives everything. Now there's there's a couple of different ways you can do IKFK. You can sometimes build the FK as base and add the IK on top so that if people want to offset an FK by an IK, they can. And this is the kind of stuff that you can only really do if you don't let your hierarchies control too much. Or sometimes you might want to give them IK control and the FK buffer is going to be driven by that IK control. So the FK becomes additive to the IK. Uh, some people like it. It basically means that if you want IK only or FK only, depending on which order you put them in, one of the two has to be zero. If they're not, you get additive, additive behavior, which could be seen as a feature or as an annoyance. Some people like Boolean switches, some people like blends, some people want uh, no switching at all and tools to do everything for them. Talk to your animators, uh, sketch out three or four solutions and show them. Um, make them choose, keep the sketches on the side because they will normally choose something and within the week realize they prefer something else after they actually animate it. So, moving on. Uh, sorry, just a second. Okay, nothing important. Moving on. Uh, what we want to do here, in this case, is do them separately so we can drive um we can drive these things by fk or by ik now when you look at what is going on with these right uh, the real effect of this item isn't the uh, isn't the actual control that you move after that's connected to the word but when you look at it the real effect that thing is having is actually going out to uh, whatever item that we're connecting the mesh to. Bloody animators. Yeah, animators are finicky creatures. Uh, it's uh, prepare for change. It's, uh, it's a myth that you can actually conceive of a rig that the animators will like for a shot. It's just, it just doesn't happen for anything that is of any complexity. And there's also the matter of opinions. So there's, there's plenty of rigs that will like split the animators uh not individually like kill them but split the animate the animation crew down the middle like half people will love it half will hate it and at that point the leader is soup will have to make a hard call and go like okay we're, we're gonna go with this anyway so what we're actually interested in if we have fkik is uh changing how we output to this so first things first uh that means that we want to switch somewhere and this is not how I do things in the long run, uh, but for the sake of getting something done, we're going to put, so we should already have an extra attribute in here, or maybe we had put it on the pedals or something. Anybody remembers where I put the blend? I was probably here. Yeah, so the blend for whether the pedals uh, spin or not was on the actual control itself, which makes sense. Uh, but if you want to escalate them to a central control panel of sorts, it's probably what you need because you can't have, you shouldn't have a blend that is on this that affects another item that it's supposed to like uh, trade behaviors with. They're supposed to be siblings, FK and IK, so you don't want one driving the other. Maybe provide them with an FK only rig and providing them with tools to let them build different IK rigs on top of it on a per shot basis could work. Yeah, rigging in shot is one of these things that um, people will eventually do in large pipelines. Every large pipeline I know of has uh, some sort of jerry rigging tools. Uh, they also become like really unwieldy and really tricky to manage, especially if you want performance to be ideal. Because if there's one thing animators are really good at doing is creating cycles in the rig level. Like they're phenomenal at doing that. There are things they can get to cycle that you didn't even think were correlated in any way. So. Uh, vector product, this is a dupe, probably don't need. Yeah, anyway, uh, going back to this. So we want to get this in the same general space that our uh, 
staves, staff, whatever buffer is in, plus a little bit of an offset. So we already have this one, making my triggering a cycle with the coffee machine in the kitchen. Yeah, that happened. So let's get rid of that. Now, some noddling going on. If anybody in chat has any good jokes that are not gonna get me in trouble, I'm willing to relay those to entertain the crowd while I actually do all the noddling necessary. So we're receiving from the word through these, uh, we are K with this being in word space now. And this is where it gets a little bit trickier and we have to do something that I'm not willing to discuss in detail yet. Uh, we will want an offset for these. So this is the buffer and we want to get, if we get at least the translate and the scale and the rotate for it, we will end up with that control in the center of the word. Uh, whereas we actually do want to inherit whatever we're getting from the God node, because that's good and proper and we like it. But we would like this buffer to be right away uh, in the same place where the pedal is. So there's a couple of different things you can do. Uh, in this case, we've created a local word and we have a pedal offset, um, which has been useful to place the pedals. And if you do something like this and you control anything, do we have that? Huh, I thought we'll add move that somewhere. Ah, yeah, because the local word goes there. So uh, that would be pretty you know pretty useful to reuse uh, but we actually want to move it one down again so you could use a matrix mode to do it straight up in the dg i don't want to go in matrices into matrices yet so what i'm gonna do is go um that was actually incorrect i guess now that we have two and we're going uh work to staff offset and that is gonna be uh, staff, sorry, what are we doing? Staff to pedals offset. And we do want this one, all right? I'm saving as well. Wow, while saving. That just happened. Ah, so let me take a screenshot of this one. Uh, this is pretty terrifying because it's in the past, it's corrupted since. So this time I have the path to, I found that it doesn't really save there just about half the time. All right. My has stopped working. Windows session is checking for a solution to the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna happen. So I gotta say my experience during the streams is not really representative stability wise of the experience of it in general. Uh, it's possibly because I'm running like fractions of the screen, running OBS uh, with a high priority uh, custom build as well and bunch of stuff. It might be making my uh, slightly less stable than it normally will be. Well, obviously it's also lost a bunch of stuff. So the preferences I've been setting have gone. Let's see if we have it. Did it crash before or after saving is the question. Has Windows ever found a solution to the problem? Has Windows ever found a solution to any problem? Oh, that I know of. So where does this put us? It did save something. 
it did actually save before the crash we're in luck we're back in the game with minimal interruption amazing so all right uh let's get back to it now we were saying we have the buffer and we should have actually now created a bunch of stuff in the input do i still have it so yes uh, very good let me save a separate scene for these in case this one is actually going to crap yeah yeah i share that yeah i man. i did not want to redo all of these uh what we in 50 minutes in uh yeah we can still do some useful work and now i'm not going to be streaming tomorrow but i will stream i will be streaming on sunday so normally i do saturday and sunday this time around i'm doing friday and sunday let's get back to these what i wanted to do was actually get that which is now in a weird space and match it come on you can do it i have faith in you and match it to that and this is the greatest addition to maya 2017 by far which you could also script with like maybe 12 lines of work before uh, now that we have that srt that in word space should be pretty reliable so what we want to do is get that one get the word space of it and again normally if i had gone through even just the basics of transform symmetric math i would not be creating these hierarchies but um remember i was saying do not depend on hierarchies do not depend on hierarchies to transmit properties to other objects building yourself a hierarchy that's completely static that just determines where things will be in their default state and then only transmitting offsets like these when they receive from another component that is absolutely and perfectly fine and it also makes it pretty easy to configure things so there is nothing bad with that although i will still do it differently but that's mostly out of principle now usual oddly ordered matrix decomposed node uh, what are we getting here so that is the word matrix and this is the control buffer what am i doing that is silly here so can anybody see if i'm doing something really stupid here so this is the input matrix which is yeah more or less off in the word where i would expect it and this is not receiving oh there you go that's what i've been doing stupidly because sure i need the sharing well before i need the translate which is not the first one here all right that's what i was doing stupidly so finally now we have uh, an ik that actually drives um that starts from the same uh pose that the fk does so the next thing we want is apply what we had to the output for the geo so let me unhide the geo because now it's interesting again and do i yeah i'll brave the fates uh, and see what happens so there is something that i don't always recommend people do in fact i would recommend that people don't do it all that often but if you don't have custom solutions custom selectors or stuff like that uh it should be a it's a sort of known enough fact but not everybody seems to know about it uh, you can actually individually control through the digigraph the position of points on geometry and if the number of points you have is relatively small and remember these are relative points if the number of points is relatively small uh, and these will be probably four you can actually take advantage of it and another thing i miss from exercise the component display so select something yeah that's cv4 that's index 4 there's zero index because they're in an array so if you wanted and in fact it's what i'm gonna do uh, remember these are uh, local to the object itself 
you will want the inverse of something. You could actually drive these points with something else. So I could take the negation of this to get that IK link to the center of the staff. Yeah, I'll waste the time to do it. So if I have that staff offset and I already have it going, okay, through a conversion, if I take its translate alone, that offset, where is it? The staff offset is going that way from zero to there. Um, and this offset is going from wherever I had that center staff to the pedals. So actually let's start with that. So if I take this local translate, it's actually gonna duplicate that in that direction. And cool. Well, for some definition of cool, it's really challenging working with this little real estate. So what that's gonna do is shoot my point by the offset that I have between these two out in that direction, which is not what I want. What I want is to actually negate, and some people in comments were saying that reverse does all kind of stuff. Uh, like somebody was saying it's actually a normal inversion. Uh, my experience, which might be flawed, is that reverse, the reverse node, if you have it, uh, will, and let's actually keep saving, uh, will literally just negate something. Let's see if that assumption is correct. Yes, it is. So I have, and this is not great, but I have an offset and I will need to look at what that is. Is that correct? Yep, one and two. So if I negate that uh, and pipe it into that control point, uh, oh, that should have been a zero basically. Then it will be transformed from the local space there to wherever that offsets negation is. So before, so local space, yeah. Anyway, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, this is somewhat useful if you want controls that indicate what is going on so that they're basically mutable, they're reacting to what you do. Uh, but, mm, so that point should be staying behind. I need to, I will need to look at what connections I've made. Uh, I still don't recommend doing it. It's a lot of graph pools that you normally will not want. Uh, and it can also be somewhat, okay, sure, move my stuff around. Uh, and it can also sometimes like uh, be a little bit unstable if you have a lot of points and you're moving a lot of them around. But there you go, now you know it exists as a possibility. So, Going back to the AK, this is taking longer than I wanted it to, but every time I get into maths, uh, that happens. Again, stop me if this stuff doesn't make sense, if you're getting lost. Uh, now I should have moved that back somewhere sensible, but yeah, it's all right. Let's just get it out of the way for now. So we do have from these, uh, in word space, uh, we do have a vector that gives us the displacement uh, from the center. Now, what we actually want is basically a rotation. So if I take uh, this buffer space, which is the one that's gonna be moved, uh, which is gonna be moved around by the link with the rest of the components and we still haven't fixed the link to the geometry but the buffer should be behaving properly uh, there is and this is the part where i are saying i really don't want to get into matrix maths yet but there's one part that's important and if i want the disposition which is relative to that uh, to be in another space then it really is so if i wanted it to be let's say into the offset is not what we want if I wanted that to be in the space of the center of the wheel in example, or these or whatever we're using, that is basically a matrix multiplication. And it applies to vectors and there's a couple nodes in Maya to do what we need. And I will be very, 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 very sketchy and brief about this. Similarly to what we've seen about vectors, you, and I think I did very briefly touch on these, you also have matrices uh, for 
uh, multiple vectors in this case and the ID matrix which is basically your word or basically what everything comes in at is normally gonna look something like this now um, Maya uses row matrices so which means you read them by the row and what that is is basically it's a bunch of numbers and this is your x-axis it's literally so if you're in word space it's literally the direction of your x-axis it's going to be one on the x because it's the x-axis uh, and zero on the others because it doesn't have any y or z offset uh, the zero at the end is what we had look at for quadri vectors which means it is just a direction it is not a displacement so then similarly you also have the second one representing well I thought I picked green. I want the green. The second one representing Y. And you might have guessed it at this point. The third one represents... Uh, what am I doing here? This, the third one represents Z. And that is literally your free axis. So when you rotate something, that matrix will basically look at the direction of those arrows compared to the previous reference frame. And that is how rotation is stored. When you see Euler angles, uh, you know, pushing something and being or order matters kind of situations, under the hood, ultimately, they normally get converted to matrices uh, for most operations. And that's what we were fishing when we we're using the uh, decomposed node on the word matrix. Now, the other bit of interest is your translation is going to be stored here. And because that is a displacement vector, it's actually going to, because it says, okay, you've, you've rotated this much. Uh, we're not going to consider scaling just yet, which is just the length of each of those. Uh, you've also been displaced this much in words. So because this is a displacement vector, it starts at zero, which means it's not being moved around. And it has a W factor of one. So if you take a vector, um, any vector, which... Uh, might be something like this and you also have a matrix and if so let's say that this is our word space and we have a matrix that represents the transform of an object so that matrix is going to be somewhere here and it's being rotated a bit on a couple of axes and it's been offset this much so we've taken an object and we rotated it and moved it in the word a little bit uh, this is its matrix representation. If I have any vector, and vectors do not have, you know, they're not, when you, when you picture a vector, like the position of an object in relation to another, it's not that if this vector is the position of the child of whatever object at this matrix, it's, it's pre-oriented like that. No, that vector is always described as starting from the center of the word. So if you wanted that vector uh, the position of something that might have been the child of that object to be going here, which is what happens when a child is multiplied by the parent, which is what happens when you manipulate hierarchies with inary transform on all the time. What you do is, in a very similar fashion to how you do the cross product between two vectors, is you multiply by the matrix, and that transmits the transform on. So that's all I'm going to say about it, and it is literally just to explain what the two nodes I'm going to be using are. Now, I have something, which is my pedal here, and I want to take, uh, and I want to connect it to something that was, where is it? To this pole mesh, which is in this space here. So what I want to get out of this, uh, because it's already working fine for that and I want minimal blend so I want as many outputs from different parts of the rig to be uh, as similar as possible is I would like to get the position of uh, this pedal back here I would like to get let's say this offset now I do not have it because if I take this which is what the animator is going to manipulate uh, this is just going to be when I move it the distance from this so this is the displacement i have i need to find where this object is in relationship to this one or whatever it is that i'm using so and this is going to be traveling around with me this is in the input so nothing that is inside my component is going to affect it which makes it a cyclic if i'm doing things right so what i can do 
and this should already exist somewhere yep um, what I can do is actually take this object and if I take the matrix that matrix is basically gonna tell me uh, this object has not been rotated uh, now, if I did this, however, that matrix would also tell me this object has been rotated this much. And it's been translated this far. Now, there is an interesting property to matrices, which is they, if you think of them as transfers, what they do is they represent the effort that's required for that object to reach a certain orientation and position. Now, you can ask matrices for their inversion uh, which means, okay, I know it took me this much to get there. Uh, what's the inverse? What's the effort required to go there? Which, if it's just a translation, it's basically going to be the negation of the vector. But if you also have rotations, it's, it's a lot trickier than that. So Maya conveniently offers that for every node right away, uh, this is true for parent and inverse both, as the word inverse matrix. So you already have it. You already know um, all the time what the inversion of that is. Now, if I take another word position here and I multiply it by the inverse of that, I should basically be able to get the offset between those two. Unless I'm forgetting something as I go. It's actually pretty tricky. Like This is stuff that I do trivially when I just need to do it. Uh, but it's actually really hard to think about it, talk about it, and do it at the same time. So there is a mode matrix node. If you're pre-2016, this needs to be loaded. It's a plugin. Uh, why it's called matrix sum in the output, I am not sure, but it's a matrix multiplication, which is what we want. Uh, and it's also one of those accursed nodes where you need to go and show all attributes to see its inputs. Um, otherwise, you can just pump stuff in it and hope the connection editor helps you out, but it often won't. Now, the order of an operation is also important because you want to take something in word position. We're talking about these. And that has to be your first term because you're telling me, okay, I want this word position. And then matrix in. So this should have two inputs. Yeah. Uh, well, it would have multiple, I imagine. And then you tell it, okay, go there and revert the effort that was applied by the object that I want to look. So you take the inverse matrix here and you do that. Now that should give me the offset between those two. So if I connect um, anything to it, you know, let's get ourselves something diagnostic. Now I also want to then decompose this so that I get our usual stuff that we can actually use in local space and now what should be happening yeah in this case it's fine is that you can see this is in word space it's parent is in word space you can see that that object is this far so this is pretty much what you do uh, to reparent an object dynamically without having to reparent them there so multiply something that you're interested in and again I'm, I'm not super fond of having to basically tell people Look, this is magic do it this way we will eventually in season one go into the actual mass proper um, but for now you know nifty trick I guess take something whatever word space you want multiply by the inverse of another object and what you will get is the equivalent of uh, the uh, the translation that you will get if they were one under the other. So chat, let me know if this is clear enough to be usable. I am not going to go into the actual mathematical details or uh, the algebraic operations behind it. So that now that you know what they do, it's they're not too hard to figure out, to be honest. Uh, just so long as you know that they exist and you want to play with it. Now, what we have done with all of that, that we might actually like is we now have that offset. So if I were to take my pedals, in example, which we should have, did we separate them before? No, we didn't. Mm, so let's do, but yeah, no, we, we can actually do it for the, 
for the sake of playing with it so they will be under the staff so if I wanted to drive my pedals uh, buffer by that right now I think I'm just relying on parenting and inverting the rotation yep hopefully this will help making it clear Sure, warp my nodes into infinity. That's exactly what I wanted you to do. Thank you. I think it's fine and clear. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully this will make sense. This is this is low going, but it's also pretty important stuff. So if I were to, and Maya does not mess with me. So now that I have that offset. Uh, you can see that the pedals buffer uh, hasn't moved anymore. Um, but what I've done is I've basically told, despite the fact that this item is not parented under these, has nothing to do with the hierarchy coming from that, it's actually parented under something else that has equivalent transforms to the one I'm using, I can actually do something like that, which is exactly the equivalent of reparenting across the graph. Um, now, what I wanted to get, however, is something else uh, because I don't want to drive can I undo my way through these let's see we will find out yeah okay so what I wanted to get out of these is actually something completely different which is I want to get a rotation uh, spheres not very good at diagnosing rotations so be adventurous and get yourself a cylinder now diagnostics pretty important uh, have I deleted the sphere? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a shit. So get yourself something that will give you a hint of rotations. And we're almost there. It's not, it's not a lot of rigging done, but it's a lot of like very important base concepts that will skyrocket our progress through the next parts. Uh, now we have got, let me see again what we have. Okay, we have got something that we know to be this offset. And we should have, that's the pedals, see the, the whole, like, pushing my graph into hyperspace, let's say that feature drives me insane, because then I literally don't know where I am anymore. Okay, so, oh, good Lord, this is painful. So, sake of diagnostics, we'll get these under the actual staff offset. Now, not unlike, and this is some crud coming from our previous transform, not unlike what we just did, if we were to take the pedal IK that we just generated a space for in relative to another hierarchy and connect it to that, we will get the same thing that we saw before. It will jump to where you would expect the pedal to be. So let's do that. Let's make sure that we're in the right space. So, right, we're good. And that should, there you go, let's see. IK control we wanted. So that's a straight up reparenting across the DG kind of operation. Now, however, what we wanted was not that. What we want is to rotate this thing. So let's move this one back to the center. For a moment, we can actually get rid of want to see the diagnostics we're working with. If I take uh, this vector, which we do have, uh, we know it to be in a certain position, uh, which is this decompose matrix. And I actually, so, and I actually suppress one of its axes. This gets a little bit more interesting in a way. So output translate. So we don't normalize. We do, yep. Uh, dot product cross product. Uh, could we use something else? But anyway, yeah. No op. Don't normalize. And if we only if we now that we're in a local space that we actually have a use for, 
if we only were to take the y and the z what we've done is basically suppress the x this becomes slightly more interesting we've just constrained to the plane that we wanted but it's still a translation so this will be okay for the pedals um, and you could probably just link it one to one to the buffer for your IK pedals if you wanted and that'd be okay uh, but it's not quite what we want now I'm not one of the things we've shown is you can limit something if I was to normalize these and then multiply it by whatever this radius is um, you will get a circle, circle constrained behavior now but what we want is something different we want the rotation for that so let's get rid of these and set it back in and this is another node that for now we're gonna uh, take on faith so uh, no operation so we said before that the dot product can be used for projections and I'm running late in this but I actually want to go over this stuff so if you have any questions ask them now because I'm probably gonna burn for the Q&A question um, one of the interesting properties that we mentioned is of dot products is that they can get to the projection of something and they can also get to the angle of something which was that cos y uh, that cos uh, theta that we discussed before so now that I have a local space if I were to take uh, these axes which uh, because I'm working with some sort of uh, localized space is pretty much just going to be the z axis and if I take the vector with the x suppressed that I've been using and if I normalize both of them right um, gotta shoot off but thanks see you man so if I normalize both of them then I could get the angle between those two so and let me show quickly on the blackboard what I'm talking about this is my object space as I'm working with it and I do have a vector to my pedals and we have just seen that let's just get a different that if I suppress the x wherever that is in word I can get something that is constrained to this plane that is pretty much a 2d vector and if I normalize that and at the same time I also take this vector we're in some local space to this so if I take a plane z which is 0 0 1 and if they're both normalized if I run the dot product what I actually get is the cosine between these two so let's actually do that um, anyway sorry I, I've actually raised ahead of myself but yeah what, what we get is the cosine between these two now uh, the inverse of the cosine is the arc cosine which given a cosine will actually give you this angle now there's a useful node in Maya which is what I'm just about to use which is angle between so given two vectors in this case we're going to be using these if you do angle between it will actually get to and this works in 3D as well it will actually get to these as an angular unit and that's what I wanted to do so hopefully I have not made too much of a mess of that by going one step too deep into the map okay show all attributes so what we want to get is we say we take this one with the x suppressed and we don't even need to normalize it in this case uh, that was just to show the properties of dot products and the such now it gives me a vector 2 and because I'm in a space that I know to be a constant space of sort I know that I want to get the angle between that and the z axis which should get me the angle rolling around that I hope this still makes sense to people I know it's a lot to digest in one go but it's also pretty important and it's the kind of stuff that you really have to play with now that uh, well clockwise counterclockwise so sometimes you actually want to invert the result I do does it because it might take sign into consideration yeah might or might not mm, no, not properly let's 
So let's make sure that we have that right. Yeah. Yeah, we need to negate the result, but basically you, you get the idea. So what is, um, what is happening is that I am taking this vector in word space and uh, where was, oh, I was working. Uh, yeah, my angle was the default was off the Y. That makes sense now. So I probably, yeah, I probably want to do that off the Y axis. I'm sorry. I hope that didn't confuse people. I forgot what spaces I was using. Yep. And that might even actually negate. No, it does it not properly anyway. So you, we need to negate the rotation, but that's it. Uh, so what is happening here is that I am uh, taking this vector. I've suppressed the X, which basically means that it's going to be on that plane. Now I am taking some default vector, which in this case is going to be my Y. And I'm using the angle between node to find out, okay, what kind of an angle and this is under the hood, this is what you do with dot product and arc sign operations. What kind of an angle do I have between these and that? Then just apply that angle, uh, which it will be on that you should only see one of these angles change, but this will work to emulate an aim constraint, or rather it is an aim constraint, and drive the rotation through that. So you know, that, that puts us in a pretty good place. Uh, I will need to look at a couple of things to make sure that I have everything in order. So that's in that direction. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully you get the idea. Now, the other thing I could do to invert it is probably uh, no op. Mm. Yeah, if this is a proper scalar operation, it would be better. Um, anyway, inverting either of the two or inverting the final angle will get us what we want. Uh, so, uh, blend, come on, I need blend, please. Additive DA, that's double flow, float array, additive 32, additive rotation, there you go. And use that one weird trick from a granny that we mentioned before. Set the weight to minus one. Let's see if this gets us what we want. Should. Can I actually get the output? That will be stellar. There you go. And that is the actual rotation that we wanted to drive the staff in IK mode. So this can now be placed anywhere. It gets. Uh, so even if you had it constrained somewhere else in the word space, it will still work because we're using the matrix map behind it to reparent it wherever it is to the center of the wheel that we're interested in. And uh, project it back. And then all we do is we find the actual angle that we're interested in. Does this make sense? I hope it does because I've burned through most of the Q&A questions, uh, Q&A time. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is something that is really, really worth learning because it pretty much removes 95% of the constraints from any rig. Uh, and it does a lot of things that you cannot quite do with constraints without a lot of trickery. Questions, anything like that? Let's blend seamlessly into the Q&A from here. dead silence. It's possible that people's minds have just been blown. So uh, at the same time, let's start actually linking that stuff to our soon of between vector product. More stuff. So that's what we want. Again, before you start messing with the actual parts of three, you want to uh, try. So this is word stuff offset. That, that's cool. Um, also remember to uh, do everything on your diagnostic objects first. There don't seem to be any questions. And this was a lot to toss out at people, I'm sure. So 509, yeah, we're good. Uh, 
All right, seems fine. So next thing we're gonna do now that we have an IK rig, I'm probably gonna just add like colors and stuff like that off stream or, uh, or something, but then we're gonna start hooking it up to the geometry. Little off topic, but are you ever using any of the Maya native constraints or avoiding them at all? Um, I tend to avoid constraints at all costs. Uh, now, if I am in a case where I need things to handle pivots, uh, constraints are actually all right. There is a very small change you want to make. When they're created, they are circular in the graph because for so that you can reparent them or reparent their, uh, their destination object at any point, constrain an object and then look up from that object its parent matrix. Uh, and I'll, I'll show it at some point. It's actually pretty well related to this. That creates a cycle. It's a benign cycle, but because it's still a cycle and uh, to determine whether a cycle is benign or malicious, the graph always has to do a little bit of work. When you get into parallel evaluation, it will actually create clusters that the custom evaluator needs to untangle. Um, they also create DAG objects, which I don't like because it's more stuff to manage. I like when I do this reparenting stuff, which is most of what constraints do. I like for that to live in the DG. I like the hierarchies to be as close as possible to being just the interface between components to the animators. Uh, I don't like to have DAG objects that are not affected by the DAG because constraints just appear in there for convenience, but they're and for manipulation's sake, but they're not quite affected by the DAG. Uh, they are also gonna affect how the transforms between those objects actually uh, communicate. So no, I try to avoid them. Uh, unless you have a lot of waste and a lot of like wasteful nodes, which is not the case when you start writing your own. Uh, these tends to be faster, it doesn't cluster up, it helps the evaluation manager when you look into parallel level and all of that. With that said, uh, it's fine to use constraints for a lot of stuff. A lot of this stuff, I could have used the constraint and done exactly the same thing and not have to jump into uh, matrices so early, which is not something I really, like I, I was very undecided about it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I'll say this is going to be about first principles. And I think that the more stuff we introduce for you guys to start looking into, the better. So, any more questions? Or did they even answer the actual question, I guess? See what I wanted to actually do. There you go. So that's the one that's now getting its stuff from the poll output. And this is another thing I actually like. Um, by having the relationship between the geometry and the um, and the control rig being so decoupled and having this middle layer. Uh, oftentimes you find that if you want to implement something, you already have a pretty good hook to do things. So I would assume we have a blend here that's worked pretty well that we use for negating something. Now, I imagine that if I were to pipe whatever this source is, which is coming from here, yep. And I was to take its rotation, put it into the other term for the blend. Come on. Cool. And then use that blend as the actual output for the rotate. We're probably also done with, with a lot of stuff. So yeah. Going in three, going in two, going in one. So we might need to fix a few things like um, the looking at what the actual numbers are. 
But uh, yeah, that is that is what I was talking about. Uh, where am I looking at this one? So if you want to blend between the items now, like your interface is pretty much already built in there. And this is actually also probably correct. Yeah. So if I do something like this, now my geometry is receiving that as it should. And if I wanted the animators to have control over IKFK blending, because we we're pretty diligent in how we abstracted the interfaces, it should be as simple as, you know, dumping this to zero and setting this to one. Yeah, there you go. That's that's your IKFK blend done. Uh, and for stuff like this, I suggest that you actually put a few keyframes in there and uh, play with it. So let's save, because this is actually pretty much where it needs to be for the wheel. All right, no more questions. I guess I'm gonna call it here. Uh, one hour and a half, one hour and 31 minutes. I reckon that's enough. And yes, I did remember to start recording. That's great. So thanks everybody for watching. Uh, thanks for being on the stream. And if you're watching this on YouTube, join the streams. Don't be a stranger.